Hi there. Today, I'll be showing how to complete the Monarch's Journey featuring Louis II the Stammerer Carling. As you can see, I own all the DLCs, but in an effort to make this guide accessible to players without them, I've only enabled the Old Gods and the Sword of Islam, the two that Paradox have made available for free. Sword of Islam was available for free download for only one weekend, but since it only enables features for the Muslim religions and we don't really interact with them in this playthrough, even if you don't have it, your game shouldn't be much different than mine. The Old Gods has been available for free since the announcement of Crusader Kings 3 for people who have subscribed to the CK3 newsletter, and in fact it's mandatory to play this Monarch's Journey because it unlocks the 867 start date, which is where this challenge starts. If you don't already have it, I've put a link in the description where you can get it for free. As you might be able to tell from my map background, I have a couple of mods installed, but they're entirely cosmetic, and they don't interfere with unlocking achievements or Monarch's Journey challenges. Here I'm just scrolling through my game rules. If you want, you can pause and set your rules to exactly the same as mine if you want to play through in the exact same fashion that I did. And as you can see, even with the cosmetic mods that I have, challenges are still enabled, as shown at the bottom. So here we are in-game, and here are our three challenges today. The first is French Toast. Hold the kingdoms of West Francia and Aquitaine, completely control their de jure provinces, and form the Empire of Francia. There's no bronze or silver tier, it's an all-or-nothing challenge, and it can be completed as long as you're playing as a member of the Carling Dynasty. Next, his unfulfilled dream. King Louis passed away before he could see through his dream of a northern crusade. Kill as many characters of the Germanic faith as possible. Reformed Germanic pagans also count in case the AI manages to reform the faith. Norse characters with the traits Viking, Ravager, Sea King, Sea Queen, Berserker, or Shield Maiden count as 2 points. 4 points for bronze, 7 for silver, and 10 for gold. And this must be completed as our starting character before he dies. Finally, there is Why Don't You Like Me. This one's pretty simple, just have as many Duke-level vassals as possible, have 65 or higher opinion of you at the same time. 4 for bronze, 6 for silver, and 8 for gold. Unlike the other Monarch Journeys, which have only had one challenge that need to be completed as the featured ruler during their lifetime, this one, as well as Unfulfilled Dream, must be completed as Louis II. As usual, the three challenges don't need to be completed all in one run. If you do one of the challenges that requires Louis to be alive, but he dies before you can finish it, you can start a separate attempt, as long as it's still on Bronze Man or Iron Man mode, and get the challenge you missed. So here we are as King Louis of Aquitaine, and we have pretty good stats, and especially good diplomacy, even with the debuff from our stutter. We are unmarried, but we already have two sons, Louis and Carloman, born of Arnsgard Ardonici. We ourselves are the son of King Charles the Bald, who holds West Francia just to the north, and if we manage to outlive him, we'll inherit his kingdom. Now, historically speaking, the marriage that produced our two sons was a secret marriage, and by 867, when the game starts, our father, Charles the Bald, had arranged a divorce between us and Arnsgard, the mother of our children, because there was another woman he wanted us to marry instead. But in the game, there's nothing stopping us from remarrying her, so we're gonna get back together with her anyway, because she's pretty much the perfect wife for us. She has good intrigue, which will contribute to the assassinations we're gonna be doing, and she's already 41, which means she probably won't be having any more kids to throw our succession into crisis. Louis has a lot to do before he dies. Getting eight dukes to like us can wait until after we inherit West Francia. We don't have eight dukes under us in Aquitaine, so we need to wait to get our father's lands and the dukes he has underneath him. So right now, we just need to sit tight, save up money, and kill a bunch of pagans. Assassination is really the only way to go here, and we need the best spy master we can get. This guy, uh, Pan Pandanulf, has 15 intrigue and is one of the best spy masters available. Assassination is the only consistent method because the other methods require killing them personally in battle, which requires going to war and leading troops ourselves, and Louis has awful martial skill and the frail trait, and the duels themselves are up to RNG and could just lead to us getting killed and needing to restart, and it's a whole mess. Similarly, there's no real way to imprison and execute Germanic pagans since we're never going to get any to come to our court. Like the challenge said, Norse characters with the special Viking and Warrior traits are worth double points, but the only characters available at the start of the game who have any of these traits are the Viking lords currently invading England, and the chance to assassinate them is very low for us, so it's more worth our time to just go after 10 regular targets than try to take out any of these. By opening the character finder and filtering by characters who are within diplomatic range and are not of our religion group, then ordering the results by religion and then by lowest intrigue, we can scroll down until we reach Germanic pagans with the lowest intrigue and thus the highest chance of assassination succeeding against them. Whenever I find one with an assassination chance in the 90s or 100s, I mark them as being of interest so I can keep track of them for later. 
At first I was just going for highest plot chance, but after I was stuck plotting against someone with 170% plot power for a long time, I figured out a better strategy. See, having other people involved in the plot gives you a higher chance of pulling the assassination off, since each conspirator has a chance to trigger the attempted assassination. But the courts of these individuals are generally not filled with people who are jumping at the opportunity to help a French Catholic guy f kill their fellow pagans. So as I figured out, what you actually want to look for are rulers who have a court of mostly Germanics, but have one or more Catholics in there. You can find courts that fit this bill in two ways. First, right-click the ruler and mouse over the plot to kill option. If there's a difference between initial plot power and possible plot power, that means there's somebody in their court who would immediately agree to help assassinate them, and it's more than likely that it's a random Catholic who's willing to do it simply because of the difference in religion. The other method is to choose arrange marriage and go through the list of bachelors in their courts to see if you can find any single Catholic men. The second method ties into a strategy I found to kill people off even more quickly. So here you can see this unmarried Catholic guy, Alan, in the court of the Count of Gwent, helping me kill a Germanic named Refer. Our plot power is 120% with him and my spy master being placed in Gwent, but we could get another conspirator and make it even better. So I searched for unmarried women who would join my court, and specifically invited as many as I could who were young and had high intrigue. Germanics won't marry Catholics, but even if the liege is Germanic, they'll still allow a marriage between Catholics within their courts, which causes the subordinate member of the marriage, the woman, to be sent to live in the same court as her husband. I arranged a marriage between one of my uh, new female courtiers and Alan, and because she's a good virtuous Catholic, I can immediately bribe her to join the plot, which bumps our plot power up over 160% due to her high interest intrigue, and a chance for either her or Alan to be the one to fire the assassination attempt event. Before too long, the assassination event should fire, and we have our first Germanic kill under our belt. The best part about this method is that once you've infiltrated your Catholic spies into a Germanic court, they can keep assassinating people without any reduction in effectiveness. I checked the courts of the rulers with the Viking trait to see if I could try this on them, but none of them have Catholic men within their courts, which is probably smart on their part. If at any point your involvement is revealed in the killings, you'll get a known murderer penalty, leading to a minus 10 opinion from everyone in the game. But this doesn't stack no matter how many times you get caught. What does stack is a dishonorable penalty, which is another minus 10, but you only get that penalty with followers of the same religion as the person you killed. And if we cared what Germanics thought about us, where would we be in this world? There's a little bit of variation in each assassination, so check the potential conspirator section each time. Sometimes you'll need to re-bribe someone to help kill a new target. But this time, a Germanic woman, who was also the spy master of Gwent, was willing to help out. Ilva added 116% plot power just on her own, which was a huge boon and caused the assassination event to fire after just over a month in-game, which is amazingly fast. If you're doing this yourself, though, consider killing off all the easy targets in the court before killing the ruler. The ruler's death caused Ilva to stop being the spy master of Gwent, which significantly decreases her plot power contribution. We killed some mayor, and then opportunities were running dry in Gwent, so I searched around for more Germanics with Catholic vassals. Next, I found the Count of Fife, who has a Catholic steward, and married another one of my makeshift assassins to him. For some reason, the Germanic Marshal of Fife is also down to help with the assassination, even without a bribe. I proceeded to kill his four children in rapid succession, refreshing my bribes as necessary. After the last kid died, control of Fife passed to Half Dan Whiteshirt, and my chances of killing anyone else there died with him. I reiterate, you can be even more efficient than I was by leaving the liege alive until all the other easy targets in their court are assassinated. My final killing ground was the county of Skagen, where Catholics and Germanics alike really wanted this guy Thorfinn dead. Didn't even have to do the marriage method. And with that, we have ten pagan kills and the first gold challenge complete. While I was doing this, the Dukes of Gascoigne and Toulouse banded together in a powerful faction and demanded independence. I didn't really have the money or alliances to stop them, so I just let it happen. It doesn't hurt our ability to assassinate, and once we inherit West Francia, we'll be strong enough to take those duchies back. If you want to do better than me, though, you can send your good spy master to the capital of the faction member's duchies, and he has a fairly good chance of triggering an event that will make you force them to leave factions and not join any for a few years. Even just kicking one of these dukes out of the faction would have prevented them from being strong enough to enforce their demands on me. Oh, and at some point I married my oldest son Louis to his cousin Juna for some reason that I don't really remember. And from here it's just a waiting game for Charles the Bald to die and for us to inherit West Francia. At least that's what I was going to do, but then the absolute madman marched off to war at nearly 60 to push his claim on the kingdom of East Francia, and won actually. He died six months later, and because of Gavilkind's succession splitting his titles, we inherit the kingdom of West Francia, as before, while our brother Carloman, not to be confused with our son Carloman, inherits the lands of East Francia, and we each get a strong claim on each other's kingdom if one of us wants to try to fight the other for it. 
but Louis was 42 at this point, so I was mostly just frantically trying to get eight dukes to like me enough before he died. I ended up doing so uh, through a combination of granting council positions, sending my chancellor to butter up the people who hate me, bribery using the huge amount of money I'd saved up while killing pagans and the inheritance from my father. Then, when the money ran out, I transferred some count and baron vassals for ten opinion a pop to the remaining dukes until I finally had eight with sixty-five opinion of me at the same time for the gold challenge. The last challenge took up the majority of my time, mainly because I approached it in a very inefficient way. The challenge requires three components. One, hold the kingdoms of West Francia and Aquitaine. We start as the king of Aquitaine, and if inheritance goes as it's supposed to, we inherit West Francia after the death of Charles the Bald, so we just have to hold on to both while we go after the other components. Step 2. Completely control all the provinces of West Francia and Aquitaine's de jure duchies. This means that when you go to the de jure territory of both kingdoms, you must control every county that's within the yellow outline. You need to go to war with quite a few people to get these borders, including the Umayyad Caliphate, which control most of Spain and are powerful as hell. It also means I needed to take back the duchies that had declared independence from me earlier, which was a step I could have skipped if I had been more diligent. I have seen on Reddit that some people have completed the challenge without holding all the de jure land in West Francia and Aquitaine, so maybe this part is bugged or misworded or something, and you don't actually need it. Number three, you have to form the Empire of Francia. I didn't carefully read the requirements for this, and if I had, I would have approached the challenge much differently. To form the Empire of Francia, you need to hold 80% of its de jure land. Conveniently, there are exactly 100 provinces in de jure Francia, so you need 80 of them. You also need a decent amount of gold, which is never a problem, and 400 piety, which is surprisingly difficult without the Way of Life DLC to span the theology focus. If you don't have Way of Life, my best advice is to hold on to as many vassal bishops as possible, because each one that likes you a lot gives you piety. Buy indulgences from the Pope in the decision menu for a flat 50, and take up every opportunity you see that gives your character a boost of piety, or to their passive piety generation, including virtue traits and traits that increase your learning stat. And finally, the part that got me. You need to hold at least one kingdom to form Francia, but that kingdom cannot be any of the kingdoms that are within the de jure empire of Francia. You need to hold a kingdom, in other words, that isn't West Francia, Aquitaine, Brittany, or Burgundy. In my opinion, this is an extremely obnoxious requirement, but it's one we have to live with, and this challenge actually gives us the opportunity to get claims on outside kingdoms, because at this point in history, we're related to practically every king in Europe. Just as an example, Charles the Bald has strong claims on Italy, La Thuringia, and East Francia. In this case, he successfully pushed his claim on East Francia and gave it to our brother through Gavilkind's succession. Well, we got a strong claim on that too, meaning that at any point in Louis II's lifetime, I could have pushed it to get a kingdom outside of Francia that would fulfill the requirement. I did not think to do this when it would have been the best time, meaning I was entirely focused on getting the 80% of land in Francia. To that end, we pick away at our neighbors. When a war ends against a particular ruler, we get a truce with them and can't declare war without crippling penalties again until the truce either expires after 15 years or until they die and another ruler takes their place. So I took some land from Brittany to complete the West Francia de Jure borders, changed my succession type to elective monarchy in both my kingdoms to keep my titles consolidated, contracted leprosy like a boss, started picking away at Gascoigne, then Toulouse, and while I was doing that, the Duke of Gascoigne died of completely natural causes, and put his five-year-old daughter in charge, meaning I could immediately push my weak claim and take the entire duchy back under my control. But I didn't, and just went to war for one county because I'm an idiot. And that's when Louis II the Stammerer died of leprosy at the ripe old age of 58, with his life's work completed and his son, Louis III, ready to continue toward the French Toast Challenge. I finished the war, and realized that elective monarchy succession requires a lot of bribing the voters to actually have my preferred heir inherit both kingdoms, found a lowborn bastard in my court with an interesting name, and immediately gave him a title, a castle, and the start of his very own dynasty as a meme. I beat up the Queen of Lotharingia for her lunch money and another county, and noticed that the British Isles are now ruled mostly by Catholics again, no doubt due to our father's brave assassination of all those Germanics. That's when tragedy struck, and during the key battles while we were crushing the Lotharingian army, King Louis III got a blow to the head and became incapable, then immediately got his leg chopped off in the same battle. He did not last long, and his brother Carloman, the younger son of Louis II, ascended the throne. Unfortunate that Louis III couldn't last for longer, but that does mean all my peace treaties are reset, so there is a silver lining. Lesson learned, don't lead troops with your ruler if you aren't ready for them to die at any given moment. We finished the war with Lotharingia, finally pushed our full duchy claim on the little girl, won, and gave the duchy to Sands, 
then took another county back from Toulouse, which we now controlled enough of to usurp the duchy title and give it to Sands also, leaving only two different counts independent of us, the previous duke and one of his former vassals who he is no longer strong enough to control. But we only have a peace treaty with the former duke, so the other count we can immediately declare war on and put his land under Duke Sands' control, as it should be. The big problem I'd been ignoring so far are the Umayyads, who control two counties we need to hold in the Duchy of Barcelona to complete Aquitaine's de jure borders. At this point, they were finishing off the last Christian rulers in Spain and had about 9,000 troops to my 6,000. I also had a ton of money and figured that one good mercenary group would allow me to nab a quick holy war victory while their attention was divided. Everything was going great until I somehow lost 3,000 troops while sieging down the provinces and saw a 12k doomstack walking toward me. I didn't realize that the Umayyads would also be able to afford a bunch of mercenaries, and their troop total was now at 14k. And they had reinforcements from another Sunni kingdom coming to help defend the faith. I made a tactical retreat back to France, but I probably wouldn't have made it if it weren't for some conveniently placed Christians who were neutral in my war uh, that happened to be in the way. The Umayyads had to stop to steamroll them, providing just enough time for my troops to get away to the next county. I offered my two young sons' hands in marriage to some strong female rulers in Italy and Germany so that I could call them in to join me. But by the time my future in-laws' troops arrived, the Muslims had taken back the lands I'd conquered and were trying to siege down my own provinces. The province they decided to take first ended up saving the entire war, as it was such a frozen, inhospitable mountain region that it caused 9,000 Umayyad troops to die of starvation and exposure while they sieged it, so it was almost immediately safe for me to return, reconquer Barcelona, then crush the weakened and starving Muslims with 3 to 1 numbers. From there, the war was decided. They never regrouped enough to challenge my army again, and Aquitaine was completely under my control. I was going to give the conquered provinces to Guillaume, the rightful Duke of Barcelona, but it turned out he absolutely hates my guts and is also a polar bear, so instead I gave control of them to this wise and pious sheik to reward him for peacefully converting to Catholicism after the Holy War. While taking some time to let my vassals forget how much they all hated me for dragging them into a long, drawn-out war with the Umayyads, I bribed the voters again, then searched around for claimants to large chunks of land within Francia. One such lad I gave a barony to, and then used his claim to take a duchy-sized bite out of Lotharingia. I had to bribe the voters again, then next I used a claimant to kick Wessex out of my French empire. The last independent county in Toulouse was now controlled by someone who doesn't absolutely hate me, so I just asked him nicely if he'd like to be my vassal, and he said yes. Such a nice change of pace. Then I killed a troublesome voter, bribed the other ones, and took another county away from Brittany. East Francia and Burgundy merged into this disgusting red blob, but they were still weak, so I took this county to get their red stain out of my beautiful blue France. My reward was needing to bribe the voters again, and I assassinated the almost 60-year-old Bear Duke of Barcelona, but got caught, so now his human son hated me and started causing just as many problems as his father did. At this point, elective succession was really getting on my nerves, and I was 62 and could keel over at any day, so I really didn't have time for Aquitaine to split off from me just because some voters were feeling wishy-washy. I realized that the West Francia electors were pretty consistently voting for my older nephew, Louis, but the Aquitaine electors favored his younger brother, Benoit. Rather than fighting it, I just set Benoit as my favorite heir for both kingdoms, and finally, finally the electors agreed on something. My Italian daughter-in-law asked me to help her out with a war in return for her helping me in some holy war against the Umayyads that I only vaguely remember. I promised to send troops over to her, you know, like a liar, because I realized that Burgundy had a new king I could take land from, as well as joining one of my vassals in his fight to take land from Brittany. Both of my wars were won easily. My daughter-in-law lost her war, but she did appreciate my help in it, so I consider that a win. Meanwhile, my older nephew Louis, the one who I originally favored but then cucked out of the election in order for greater stability, asked me for land. I told him, yeah, land is great, but have you ever tried giving up your noble birthright and the ability to have sex and instead go become a priest? He was already doing so well as my court chaplain, I thought he might react well. He did not, running off to Burgundy and spending two years raising a massive army to take France from me by force. Not massive enough, though, so I beat him up and put him in time out. I suppose in any other story I'd be the evil uncle that the heroic young prince defeats, but guess what? Evil uncle is 62, trying to keep the kingdoms together, has all the land in the empire Francia he needs, and just has to keep his crusty self alive while he gains piety one point per agonizing month. Anyway, it was only at this point that I realized I need an exterior kingdom to form the empire for French toast, and that because I hadn't pushed my claim on East Francia with previous rulers, it had decayed from a strong claim to a weak one that I could only push if there was a woman or a child on the throne. And the current king of East Francia was a young, healthy 19-year-old man. My other nearby options were trying to conquer a kingdom in Spain, which, no, or to keep picking away at Lotharingia which I was already encroaching upon and which had plenty of claimants ready for me to push them onto duke titles. 
After enough of these, I'd be able to usurp the kingdom for myself. My heir, Benoit, was such a good boy that he already had almost 400 Jesus points, so everything was still proceeding decently. I spent Carloman's twilight years and some of his vast wealth to build new castles to turn claimants into vassals. Then my wife died. Then I died at the ripe old age of 74 years old and with the road paved for King Benoit to finish the fight. The claim on East Francia was completely gone at this point, but Lotharingia was still a viable option. I took one duchy for a claimant, then began a long waiting game for the peace treaty to either run out or for the king of Lotharingia to die and put a new target on the throne. Thinking back on it, I should have at least tried to assassinate him. While enjoying the pretty colors created by Lotharingia being ruined by a civil war and three external conquests at the same time, I stomped out factions with my spy master, rigged the elections for what would hopefully be the last time, and conquered the last bit of Wessex land in Brittany mostly out of boredom. And that's when I saw it. The king of East Francia had been killed in battle at only 29 years of age by some no-name Viking, and put his underage son on the throne. And somewhere in this mess of distant cousins and inheritances, the game decided I should get a weak claim on his kingdom, a claim I had every right to push with an 11-year-old child on the throne. It was a drawn-out war, but the results were inevitable. I pressed the sacred button I'd been waiting for, accidentally created the Kingdom of Franconia instead of the Empire like I meant to, but thankfully still had enough piety left over to do both. And that's how you get French toast and complete this monarch's journey. Thinking about it, I could have taken East Francia earlier, but think about how difficult it was for me to just keep two kingdoms together while I was getting the land and piety necessary to form the empire. Even if I'd never gotten the claim on East Francia, I would have eventually worn down Lotharingia to the point of being able to usurp it. So I'd say it's a trade-off that you have to decide on in your game. Take East Francia, or one of the other nations that you have a claim on early, and juggle the succession laws of three kingdoms at once, or wait until the exterior kingdom is the last step you need, and risk not being able to have an easy claim on it. After 84 years, the grandson of Louis II the Stammerer, Emperor Benoit, rules over the united lands of Charles the Bald's sons, ready for a new golden age for the French Empire and all its people. So here's me, and my great-grandfather, Charles the Bald, while controlled by the AI, conquered the kingdom of East Francia from his great-nephew, Ludwig III, so that both of his sons would inherit a kingdom when he died, with Louis II the Stammerer taking West Francia and Carloman I the Lame, not to be confused with Louis II's son, Carloman, who I played as, taking the East. The title passed to Carloman I's son, Charles IV the Drunkard, then to his oldest son, Carloman II, who was assassinated while only having a daughter. So the crown went to his younger brother, Amori, who apparently died of poor health at 16 without having any kids, which is kind of suspicious. So it went to his even younger brother, Charles V. But three years later, a faction rose up and threatened civil war if their claimant wasn't given the throne of East Francia. And Charles V agreed, probably because he was also the king of Burgundy, so he would still hold that kingdom. That claimant was Ludwig IV, the second son of Ludwig III, who Charles the Bald had taken East Francia from. In the first place, Ludwig himself and his oldest son, Karl the Cruel, were dead already, meaning that, at this point, East Francia is back under the control of Ludwig's descendants and no longer under the control of Charles the Bald's descendants, though still held within the Karling dynasty. Ludwig IV had a son, but he's a bishop, so disqualified from inheritance, so the crown passed to Ludwig's younger brother, Adamar. Adamar died only having a daughter, so the crown went to his nephew, Baldemar, the, who was the son of the dead oldest brother, Carl the Cruel. Baldemar got killed by some random Viking, leaving his oldest son, Baldemar II, as king, meaning he was the great-grandson of Ludwig III, who at first glance isn't that closely related to me. I'm all the way over here. I'm a pretty distant cousin from him. But when I was playing as Louis the Stammerer, on a whim I married my son, Louis III, to his cousin, Juta Carling, who I didn't know at the time, but was the sister of Duke Ludwig III, who owned East Francia. So on top of being connected to Charles the Bald up here and all of these guys, I am also the nephew of Ludwig III, who originally owned East Francia, making me the first cousin once removed of Baldemar I, which does in fact mean that with the death of Baldemar I, I get a weak but valid claim on the kingdom of East Francia, a claim I was entirely justified in pushing because Baldemar II, who is my first cousin twice removed, was an underage child on the throne. <sighs> Carlings, man. Not even once.